We're ready. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for coming or for those of you who will watch this remotely. Uh, this is John Palmaria from Penn State, and I'm going to take the next 20 or 25 minutes to talk to you about some of the research activities uh, in our group. Uh, as on the screen now, you'll see an image uh, taken from the outside of our laboratory <clears throat> that shows the number of um, vacuum deposition tools that are available to support this work. And on the left is a list uh, of the graduate students and postdoctoral um, researchers that are responsible for all of the work that I'll show this morning. So. I'll summarize the research activities first by introducing the lab and the capabilities that we have. And then I'll highlight uh, some research activities uh, in the fields of entropy interst stabilized oxides uh, in nanoenergetic materials, um, infrared plasmonic science and technology, and then a few words about uh, sputtering that we use um, in all of these projects. So this is a snapshot of uh, the primary <clears throat> major pieces of equipment uh, in our laboratory. Uh, we currently have uh, nine vacuum deposition tools, uh, either sputtering or evaporation or laser ablation. Uh, the characterization tools that support this work uh, include uh, some electrical measurements, uh, a nice calorimeter, um, an X-ray diffractometer with um, thin film as well as powder optics, um, hall testing, and then not shown here, we also have an atomic force microscope. These are the instruments that are readily available in our laboratory and they are complemented by uh, a substantial amount of shared facilities at Penn State that I'm sure um, have been made, uh, you have been made aware of in other aspects of the PAC program. I'm gonna start talking about um, an activity that's near and dear to our group and that is um, entropy stabilized oxides. And this work is driven by current interests to identify new ways in finding materials that escape uh, potential approaches. <clears throat> the work that we are doing now is inspired by the now 10 year old fields of high entropy alloys. And in this research area, uh, people chemically engineer configurational entropy by adding five or so components in near equimolar quantities uh, to design new metal alloys. And iron, chromium, uh, manganese, nickel, cobalt is the first one that was uh, engineered back in 2004. And we have used this pioneering work to inspire uh, a parallel activity in the area of oxides, carbides, and nitrides. So to summarize, high entropy alloys have had dramatic impact on metal alloy research in less than 10 years. And about four years ago, we asked the question, is the same thing possible for non-metallic systems? <clears throat> and we considered this opportunity back in 2014 where we thought to ask the question, can we actually use configurational entropy to stabilize a new phase of, of crystalline matter and go beyond what the metal alloy folks have done in just showing that high entropy systems are interesting. And the idea was to test this hypothesis because if it's correct, there are many impossibilities for new materials discovery. So to do this, you need to do a clean experiment where you change only the configurational entropy in a crystal. And you need to do this in a system where charge neutrality can be maintained at an arbitrary composition. Uh, to do that, you need a nice valence structure with uh, many cations. So after much more searching than we did originally, we came up with this oxide we call the J14. It was the 14th one that uh, we looked at. And it was an equimolar combination of magnesium, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc oxides. And we found that if you mix these materials together, you indeed do get a single phase solid solution at or just before 900 degrees C um, thermal anneals. <clears throat> now, if this material is truly entropy stabilized, the phase transition um, to it should be endothermic. And I show here uh, the data that we think is the most important of all this work, and that is temperature dependent X-ray diffraction on the left and a calorimetry scan of the same material on the right. And what you see from this, uh, these two data sets is that uh, at, at or around 875 degrees C, you go from many X-ray uh, reflections to a single X-ray reflection that is consistent with the rock salt structure. <clears throat> and the calorimetry shows that this transition is accompanied by a strong endotherm. So if you have an endothermic transition, right, it has to be an entropic transition. So a long story short is that we identified that it is indeed possible to entropically stabilize uh, both oxides and carbides and probably others. <clears throat> and the new oxide that we identified in 2015 um, is this, again, equimolar, com com equimolar composition of the um, um, period three element, period three metals. 
Um, it reversibly transforms from multiple phases to single phases at about 875. And it's a first example of a material completely engineered for entropic stabilization. So the perspective from about four years of work is that this high entropy crystal and others are excellent solid solvents. And by experiment, we know that we can use them to put unusual cations into unusual coordinations. So for example, we can put nearly 20% of scandium or germanium or tin or antimony into rock salt, which they really don't want to do in low pressure systems. The same is true for molybdenum and tungsten into cubic rock salt carbides. Um, for samples that have a lot of copper, we can see that Jan Teller distortions occur uh, and can be oriented depending on how they're prepared. <clears throat> and ultimately, this is a departure from uh, gov structures governed by Goldschmidt's packing. So for the entropy stabilized materials, the local structure is critical and represents an opportunity. And we observe that these ESOs do a lot of weird things and the materials research community is, is now taking notice. So I'll just give you one or two examples. <clears throat> this is composition we call it J30. It's the parent composition J14 where we've now added an equimolar component of scandium and we can make epitaxial films of this stuff um, at very modest conditions shown here, about 400 degrees, uh, laser ablation uh, on an MGO substrate. And we get beautiful materials that stay coherent to the substrate to surprising thicknesses. And this is one example of how these materials behave differently than their low configurational energy counterparts. Uh, there's a resistance to defect formation in, in many fronts. <clears throat> if we go and take our parent compound J14, and then again make epitaxial materials um, on magnesium oxide substrate, and just look at deposition temperature, um, what you can see here in the, the right panel is a series of X-ray diffraction patterns where we do nothing besides change the deposition temperature for about 200 to 600 degrees. And what you can see is that at around 350 or, or thereabouts, there is a transition of the out-of-plane lattice constant that amounts to about a 4% change. And we've duplicated this effect on different substrates. We've seen that this effect um, can be expressed similarly or differently if we add additional components. It's another aspect of how these materials are simply uh, different than their low entropy counterparts. An interesting thing that, uh, that George Katsonis has demonstrated is that if you take this J14 composition and prepare heterostructures, for example, a 300 C, degree C deposition condition and a 400 degree C deposition condition and stack them together, you can actually get homostructures where the composition is identical, but the out of plane lattice constants and the local structure is quite different. So again, <clears throat> there's opportunities to do very interesting things in these high entropy systems. So the opportunity space is, um, I guess is best summarized by saying, entropy gives you structure and whatever formulation that you have chemically uh, identified, that will tend toward a structure with the minimum number of sublattices with the maximum symmetry. And so we think about this, <clears throat> the opportunity space as look for structure predominated properties for these opportunities, and then engineer compositions that otherwise would not be available. Because this entropy really gives you some local degrees of freedom in terms of solubility, occupancy, and valence and that can lead to new materials. So I know as um, George has explored um, at Kiel, um, this idea of a fluorite Bixbyite uh, structural uh, transition where <clears throat> we can potentially use entropy to stabilize the delta bismuth oxide phase, which usually only occurs in fluorite materials with an AO2 composition. Maybe we can preserve that structure in a Bixbyite phase, which normally prefers an A2O3 composition. And there's precedent for this in bismuth oxide where um, at about 720 degrees C, you can transition between these two phases um, and get some very interesting ion conducting properties. We think there's very interesting opportunity space uh, in mixtures of the rare earth oxides. Right? Shown here is a phase diagram that illustrates the diverse structures and symmetries that these oxides can accommodate as a function of temperature. And the one that we're interested in is this cubic disorder structure up here where the interesting transport properties <clears throat> arise. So we've been exploring this material, cerium, lanthium, praseodymium, samarium, yttrium oxide, 
And we think it's very interesting um, in terms of the structure that it forms and in terms of the rapid ion conduction as suggested by some nonlinear uh, resistance behavior that we've seen and which uh, George has explored and I guess we'll return to Kiel to explore more um, in just a few weeks. So we're very interested in these materials. There's lots and lots of opportunities, lots and lots of composition spaces uh, that can be explored. Uh, and we're very happy to have to host people who are interested in working in this um, science and opportunity space. So I'll next uh, talk about our efforts in um, a large program that we have uh, at Penn State, which looks at ultimately multimodal energy transfer at interfaces. <clears throat> And the underpinning idea is that we want to explore and identify and define mechanisms of energy transfer or transduction um, at engineered interfaces. <clears throat> and we want to do so far from equilibrium. So we're supporting material systems that support energy transfer either through vibrations or through plasma and electron coupling uh, or through chemical reactions. <clears throat> and we're using the combination of advanced synthesis tools in our group uh, with ultra-fast spectroscopy in partnering groups at the University of Illinois and the University of Virginia, and those who do multi-scale modeling at North Carolina State University and the University of Southern California. And the overarching goal is to study extreme non-equilibrium excitations at interfaces um, confined within nanoscale geometries over time periods spanning picoseconds to microseconds. So the overarching technical approach is to add energy to a system in a short, intense pulse and produce a departure from thermal equilibrium. <clears throat> and there are two general ways where we do this. We either do it elastically, where we essentially fire a very small aluminum bullet at a material and launch a shock wave that propagates supersonically. And we wanna do is look at how the material responds to the excited volume and how the system relaxes back to the equilibrium state. The other way to do it is electromagnetically, where we can illuminate either a semiconductor or a metal or a degenerate semiconductor with either a sub or super band gas, gap laser and excite either electronic carriers or plasmonic um, oscillators at very, very high energies by using very, very intense laser pulses you know, on the origin of gigawatts per centimeter squared. And we want to find uh, what are the pathways <clears throat> by which electrons go back and equilibrate with the lattice after that very intense excitation pulse. So we have three program tasks. I'll talk about two of them. Uh, one is in the area of re reactive nanolaminates. You can think of this as thermite at the very, very, very small length scale. And the other is plasmonic heterostructures, <clears throat> where we combine, in our case, um, polaritonic hosts of either surface plasmon polaritons or epsilon neuro oscillation modes uh, with very intense laser pulses. So ultimately we create material stacks uh, with interfaces that are engineered for either energetic relaxation, energy deposition, uh, energy evolution through reactions or other transduction events. So there's a number of interesting sci scientific opportunities with the re reactive nanolaminates, which is where, uh, where we'll start. So reactive nanolaminates are essentially thermites that are prepared with nanoscale dimensions. And for those of you who either are unfamiliar or need a reminder of what thermite is, <clears throat> it's a mixture of a metal, an elemental metal, and a metal oxide where the free energy of oxidation of the metal is stronger than the free energy of oxidation of the oxide. If you take that combination and prepare it so that it is physically in contact, and add some energy to get the reaction going, the elemental metal will scavenge oxygen from the metal oxide, and that exchange reaction releases on the order of 400 kilojoules per mole. Right? And this is a very large number. It's, um, it's four times higher than many conventional uh, organic energetic materials. So in the right, <clears throat> these are TEM images of the aluminum copper oxide system, one of the classics. And this highlights one of the experiments that uh, we do very frequently is we take a stack, <clears throat> silicon substrate, aluminum metal, copper oxide, metal oxide, and we keep the entire stack thickness the same, but we increase in stepwise fashion the density of the interfaces. 
these were all made by um, DC and combinations of DC and RF magnetron sputtering in tools developed by our laboratory. And the idea here is that we can increase the density of these metal metal oxide interfaces from a very low value to a very high value. <clears throat> and when we add energy to the system, we can look at how that interface density, which is the variable, influences how transport occurs across these layers and how energy is released. And ideally we can learn what happens as a function of the time scale. We have a fairly good idea of how these reactions evolve and propagate over the scale of micro to milliseconds, but it's nanoseconds, picoseconds to nanoseconds where the interest lies because those pico to nanosecond responses tell us what's happening at the very, very early stages of reaction when we're just getting that first metal and that first oxygen to cross the interfaces. So the way we do this um, in collaboration with uh, Dana DeLott at the University of Illinois <clears throat> is to prepare one of our nanolanimate structures shown in this cartoon here and launching using a laser uh, what they call a flyer plate. And it's a supersonic aluminum bullet that's uh, launched by a very intense laser. And they can take these little aluminum flyer plates and launch them at velocities up to three kilometers per second. That aluminum bullet hits this, this nanolaminate, it launches a shock wave, and the idea is to understand how that shock wave promotes that, um, that thermite reaction and how it evolves in both temperature and time. So we prepare these on a, a thick glass substrate, they then watch the backside of the substrate and collect all the light that comes out. They can do it in the visible to generate uh, a map of where this reaction is occurring. They could also do it in the uh, IR to visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum to measure temperature as a function of time um, locally. So it's a very powerful tool that is leading to some very interesting insights into how these reactions progress. So the science opportunities in this research are to understand the quantitative relationships uh, between the reaction rates, the exothermic outputs, uh, and the material properties of these reactive nanolaminate members, and ideally relate the short time phenomena to the longer time phenomena <clears throat> and to the constitution of the initial uh, layer materials. And it's a combination of models and, this is, and synthesis and characterization that we're using to address these questions. And ultimately, we're trying to find both scientific and engineering approaches to tailor how these materials release energy in a predictive fashion. So one highlight that I'll show you um, is to uh, is a highlight based on uh, the synthesis and the how we use these ultrafast tools to understand how these uh, reactions are evolving. And again, we're doing this um, using a combination of Sort of bulk parameters like phase equilibria and def defect chemistry and transport properties um, and these ultra-fast uh, methods to understand how these relate to energy release. So the system that we use to make these materials is shown here. It's a, um, a magnetron sputtering tool that currently has uh, four sources <clears throat> and one of the things that it, it offers is a cooling stage so we can keep these uh, materials uh, quite cold to avoid reactions that would otherwise occur because of the heat that um, is unavoidable during sputter deposition. And we've engineered a stage that actually rotates while it has cooling water so that we can expand the, the number of materials um, that, uh, that can be prepared as, say, clean interface thermites, um, as well as um, prepare them in a, in, a, in, a, in a rather quick fashion so that we can um, have they produce samples quite easily to our collaborators. Uh, the system can also coat uh, planar substrates uh, as well as other odd shapes. And we're providing samples to our collaborators at rates of more than 100 samples per year. So one experiment that we did a couple years ago uh, was demonstrated is, well, it's illustrated here, and it's where we use one of this, these odd substrate geometries. So we've been collaborating with the, the group of uh, Michael Zachariah at the University of Maryland to take these thermite layers and ignite them very quickly and use a mass spectrometer to monitor the materials that come out. And the way the, the experiment works is we prepare um, a very thin wire of platinum, and then we coat that wire of platinum with our thermite multilayers. Right? 
In this case, um, the experiment I'll show you is a um, aluminum copper oxide stack. We then hook up that platinum wire to some high current leads, and then we can rapidly introduce current and heat this wire resistively at a rate of about uh, 100,000 uh, K per second. We initiate that reaction and a combination of a high speed camera and a time of flight mass spec uh, we can use to uh, monitor the reaction at um, you know, nano to milliseconds or micro to milliseconds. So this experiment is, is not a new one. People have been doing such experiments for a long time using nanopowders of, for example, aluminum and copper oxide to coat these wires. But no matter how hard they try, they always get a really um, irregular morphology that's, um, that's not particularly dense and introduces some limitations to how much you can learn from the experiment. So we took our, our instruments and our know-how of thin film preparation and developed a fixture to prepare these nanolaminates um, on a very thin platinum wire shown here in cross-section. You can see in this SEM image, here is our PVD coating, right, aluminum and copper oxide. And if you zoom in on it, <clears throat> you can see that we have nice uh, distinct layers in aluminum and copper oxide in a single bilayer, in a three bilayer, and in a six bilayer stack. All of these prepared right, as a coating on a thin platinum wire that can be then resistively heated very quickly. And you can use a mass spec to monitor the outcome of the reaction. And this is one example of um, this fast paced reaction. Here's a three bio layer sample and an eight bio layer sample. The idea here is that you have a three X increase in the number of interfaces. So the density of that reaction, right, once it initiates, um, should be very different. And you see very, very much that it, it is in the three bio layer case, we see, um, we, we identify the ignition temperature as the temperature at which we have a strong evolution of material from the mass spec. <clears throat> in the three bio layer case, it occurs at 860, and that's oxygen liberated to the gas phase. So really what we're seeing is a reduction in the copper oxide to Cu2O. In the eight bio layer case, we see a very, very different um, behavior. At about 400 degrees C, we see strong evolution of aluminum vapor, oxygen gas, copper vapor, and Al2O. Okay? So this structure is getting much, much hotter, right? Probably 3000 Kelvin because you're evolving Al2O gas. So this would be a true nanolaminate ignition. This would be essentially thermal decomposition. And we transition that by changing these layer thicknesses, which changes our diffusion length, which changes the energy density of the reaction. <clears throat> okay, uh, once again, we have a system dedicated to making these systems. Uh, we have roughly sort of one and a half people working on this project. Um, and we'd be happy to host uh, individuals interested in making these high energy density structures. So I'll move on now to the second half of this large program, which is plasmonic heterostructures. So we're serving in this case interests uh, to understand and enable new mechanisms of light matter action. <clears throat> and we're very interested in the infrared. So we're interested in infrared harvesting, infrared sensing. There are application spaces um, in terms of uh, night vision, in terms of um, light induced or enhanced catalysis, uh, in terms of chemical imaging in the gas phase. <clears throat> and we think that exploring plasmonic structures excited to very high energy modes um, in the infrared provide us preferred energy decay paths to affect all of these interesting application concepts. So the motivation um, is illustrated in this slide here where I show two relatively recent um, say literature examples uh, where people have been exploring plasmonic materials and designs um, that harness the excellent transduction mechanism between optical fields and charge carriers that plasmons provide, um, as well as the sub-wavelength of the local fields um, that can be achieved in these modes. Um, but most researchers have done so using um, pattern metals and in invisible light. And one nice example here <clears throat> is from uh, the Atwater Group at Caltech, where they're using plasmonic excitations uh, in gold and ITO uh, to launch surface plasmon polaritons in channels, essentially making right, a plasmonic um, transistor. So there's lots and lots of research in plasmonics. Anyone who has looked and done a literature search and just typed in the word plasmon will be inundated with papers um, 
our niche in this field is to push these applications uh, into the mid-wave IR. That's where there's, say, there's a materials challenge <clears throat> and a technology opportunity um, if, a per, if anyone is successful. So I just want to give a very brief background of what we're talking about here. <clears throat> so if I consider um, fundamentally electron gas, uh, that electron gas has a dielectric function uh, given by this equation here with a strong frequency dependence. If I plot the dielectric function here, just the real components, uh, I find that the function has a zero where it crosses the, the zero axis in dielectric constants at uh, frequency omega naught, which we define right, as the plasma frequency of this system. At frequencies below the, this plasma frequency, the electrons right, can follow the field and we anticipate attenuation and reflection. Um, if we think about the frequencies um, uh, just around right, this uh, epsilon or yeah, epsilon uh, zero condition, right, these are the conditions where we have strong plasmonic interactions. Uh, it's also the conditions where we can change these plasmonic interactions by very, very small changes in the dielectric function, right, which since it's surrounding zero, are relatively speaking very, very large changes. <clears throat> so we're very interested in preparing materials where this plasma frequency is in the region that's very close to this zero condition. And there are people in the, in the community now call this the epsilon near zero mode. And they're really just talking about a plasmonic host where you're interacting with light very close to uh, this zero condition. Now, how do you do that? Um, we do that by engineering what are called in these, these epsilon near zero modes. And you achieve an epsilon near zero mode by taking a dielectric conductor dielectric stack, um, as we show here. Uh, the conductor should have a bulk plasmon polariton that is, supports um, the optical oscillation at this near zero condition. And you do that by engineering the carrier density. You further take these two interfaces and you bring them very close together. And you bring them close enough together so that the electromagnetic plasma oscillation that occurs right, at each interface between conductor and dielectric interact. And that interaction right, has a symmetric solution where most of the electric field gets concentrated in the conductor. And that's a function right, of both the carry density of the conductor, the permittivity of the dielectric on each side, and the proximity of those two interfaces. When you get the thickness, the dielectric permittivity, and the conductor plasma frequency, and thus epsilon near zero energy, you know, all in the right condition, right, you achieve the, what people refer to as the impedance match mode, where light coming in is completely, nearly completely concentrated in that conductor. And when you do that, you generate really, really large fields. And when you generate really, really large fields, then you can start to see interesting, interesting things like nonlinear behavior. So in a nutshell, we like these epsilon near zero modes because they give us high field concentration, they confine light in extreme sub-wavelength conditions, and they allow us to observe strongly nonlinear optical behavior. The material that we like to use um, to access these structures are thin films of cadmium oxide. <coughs> so I show here a plot of normalized reflection as a function of energy of a series of thin cadmium oxide layers on our plane sapphire, where all we're doing is changing the carrier density from about three times 10 to the 19 to about 1.5 times 10 to the 20 per centimeter cubed. And simply by changing that carry density and the film thickness, we can change the optical absorption, right? All throughout the infrared, the mid infrared portion of the IR spectrum, right? And we know that interaction is changing because of the maximum in absorption, right? Which corresponds to a minimum in the intensity that these materials ex uh, experience with illumination of IR light. Just to give you an idea, um, if we take the example right in the center of the mid-IR spectrum, uh, that corresponds to a wavelength of about 400 nanometers. We can engineer a perfect absorbing layer of cadmium oxide when it's only 50 nanometers thick and experiences a carrier density somewhere in the high 19s to low 20s per centimeter cubed. Right? So it's a really interesting say, geometry where a very, very small structure is absorbing and interacting with very long wavelength light. 
And it's because of that overlapping interface mechanism. So the anchor to this program um, is thin films of cadmium oxide. Our group has spent about seven years learning how to grow these. And currently I would argue that we make the world's best um, TCO films of cadmium oxide because we get the greatest combinations of transparency with really, really high uh, conductivities. <clears throat> Originally, we made these materials using molecular beam epitaxy. We have a nice paper on that. More recently, we've switched to uh, pulse DC sputtering. We have a series of papers uh, on cadmium oxide prepared using uh, those instruments. Uh, the most important thing is shown here in this plot of mobility as a function of free electron concentration. Right? In cadmium oxide, no matter how we make it, either by MBE in blue dots or by impulse magnetron sputtering in red dots, we get a really, really unusual combination of mobilities that in some cases exceed 500 at carry densities well into the 10 to the 20 range. Okay, So it's a really, really interesting combination of mobility and carrier density that lets us sustain these really sharp plasmonic oscillations, achieve very, very high intensity internal fields, which allow us to investigate these extremely interesting and nonlinear linear reaction or interactions. So we make cadmium oxide using um, a nice oxide sputter tool that's dedicated to, uh, to that purpose. We are all also now looking into doing similar things in the nitrides, focusing now on indium and gallium nitride that we're making with a second, um, now a new UHV sputter tool that came online uh, about eight or nine months ago. And again, we're working uh, very hard with a number of collaborators <clears throat> who are helping us um, do some very interesting things. So some highlights in the plasmonics field. Um, recently, we were able to observe um, hybrid um, um, superposition of modes, stacking plasmon polariton and ENZ layers. Uh, we can stack ENZ modes to make um, tunable, say, infrared absorbers or emitters. Um, we've demonstrated interesting trends between thermal conductivity and carrier concentration. Uh, and most recently, this is now published, um, we observed ninth order high harmonic generation by exciting one of these um, ENZ layers. Okay. We're also looking at uh, currently um, converting these plasma oscillations into uh, thermopiles, which can give us wavelength specific um, IR detection. Okay. So I want to spend a little bit of time as I wrap up um, talking about sputtering. Our group does a lot of sputtering. We have a bunch of sputter tools. Um, we truly like say, exploring the limitations and the, the limits of synthesis by science um, in the uh, sputtering regime. And in this context, we've become very interested in, um, in high pulsed uh, plasma techniques. So many limitations of DC and RF sputtering originate from a relatively modest power density that limits everything about the, the plasma, right? The heat of the plasma, the ionization fraction, its reactivity, uh, et cetera. The power density elimination limitations originate uh, from target overheating. People have known this for a long time, and to overcome this, uh, they've engineered what's called high power impulse magnetron sputtering or, or high PIMS. It's a pulse discharge method where your duty cycles are low, but your instantaneous power densities are very high. So 5% duty cycle greater than a kilowatt per centimeter squared power density. This allows you to achieve a very high ionization fraction it allows you to access the self-sputtering regime, and it translates into a number of very interesting advantages. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go a little quicker here because I'm you know, running a little bit um, over on time. I want to respect the 30-minute request. Um, you can look through these um, at your leisure, but the difference between conventional and high PIMS plasmas is that you can enter the self-sputtering regime. And you enter the self-sputtering regime because you generate, due to the high power densities, um, metal ionization through electron impacts. And that allows you to get this, this very, very high ionization fractions, very reactive plasmas, and in some cases, more favorable mechanisms to deal with things like target uh, poisoning. So one of the things that we're very, very interested in currently is looking at high PIMS to engineer new sputtering modes. So those of you who have sputtered and tried to do so with more than one cathode know that the magnetic and the electric fields communicate and the composition and the energetics of a plasma with multiple sources can be very nonlinear with power and very difficult to control and very difficult to reproduce. 
<clears throat> so we're looking at addressing this sputtering challenge by accessing the pulsed behavior of high PIMS plasmas and engineering the pulsing from multiple sources so that we have non-overlapping and thus non-interfering isolated plasmas on the scale of micro to milliseconds. So what we refer to this is, um, is patterned pulsed high PIMS. And you can consider the, the, say, the baseline experiment where we take target A and target B, set the powers so that they have, let's say, some relative uh, number of fluxes on a per pulse basis. We can identify a composition ratio that we want, use the flux per pulse ratios and a pattern pulse train to then achieve the compos composition of interest. So that's shown here. Right, here's our pulse train. Here's our second pulse train. Uh, we do, for example, a five to four ratio of the equivalent fluxes. We know the relative ratio of each flux per pulse. That should give us mathematically the desired composition A to B to one. Okay. Interesting concept, but we're still gonna have crosstalk because these plasmas are gonna interact. So the next thing we can do is set up a series of external triggers and then we can determine or identify a pulse pattern. In this case, our example is niobium and tungsten, where we stagger the pulses so that they never interact. They, they never interact. And we refer to this as asynchronous pattern pulse uh, deposition. And what we find is that it works really, really well. So for our example of percent niobium in a niobium tungsten alloy system, we can do nothing but change our pulse ratios, change our compositions nearly arbitrarily, Right, and achieve the percent niobium uh, that we want as measured by EDS in an, in an SEM. So I'll just say this is something that's very new for our group, and we would love to have someone who wanted to come and work with us and further develop this asynchronous pulse pattern uh, a deposition technique. Uh, there's a senior graduate student working on it now who's going to graduate very soon, um, so it's a great opportunity to catch or to benefit from his experience. I'll finally finish up by saying um, identifying a nitrite opportunity. There's literature uh, indications that three nitride films like gallium nitride can prepare, be prepared by high PIMS at record low temperatures. There's a lot of debate in the communi community regarding um, its applicability. If correct, the rewards are huge. So there's a number of papers uh, that, are in, in, that have been published by the Arakawa group from uh, University of Tokyo, where they demonstrate, for example, gallium nitride with mobilities of 1,000, carrier densities in the mid-16s, Right, prepared at less than 400 degrees C. And this is important because it's done by sputtering. There's no hydrogen, no ammonia, and no carbon. So those of you that know the nitrides community know that this is kind of a big deal. There's lots of people that um, are not necessarily certain if these results um, can be reproduced. So just to summarize the opportunity, GAN, ALGAN, and INGAN, and aluminum nitride with excellent crystallinity, low carrier density, of high carry density and record mobility have been reported. They do it with high PIMS, they do it at very low temperatures, <clears throat> but other groups um, have not been able to duplicate these results. So very recently, uh, we got excited by this um, opportunity. So we built a new chamber. This is a, a true UHV sputter tool um, that is designed to test this nitride, low temperature, high PIMS sputtering uh, hypothesis. So we constructed this sputter tool uh, back in March of 2019 um, and have been working on it since. So we are using boundary conditions where our substrate conditions are less than 500 degrees C. The only gases we're using are argon and nitrogen. We're sputtering from a gallium metal target. Um, we're using MOCVD prepared GAN as native substrates. Um, and we're using the same approaches based on understanding gallium supersaturation that have been um, used by the MOCVD community uh, for many years. We have interesting structural data, transport properties, hopefully coming soon. But the bottom line is that um, if we're careful with our gas flows, which we use to control our gallium fluxes, we generate some very interesting results. So I show you just one example here of a gallium nitride film prepared at 500 degrees C by pulsed sputtering on a substrate that was not treated um, beforehand versus a substrate that was that was treated with the plasma treatment designed to nitride the surface fully after air exposure 
And what you'll notice in this AFM image is this beautiful step and terrace morphology that is decorated by screw dislocations that occur from the gallium nitride underneath that occurred from its deposition on sapphire. But the bottom line is you can generate a step and terrace structure that is previously thought to be only achievable in MOCVD type processes where your temperatures are well above 1000 degrees C. So this material was prepared at somewhere between 475 and 500. So it's a pretty exciting result. It gives us, let's say, optimism um, that nitrides can be prepared in very interesting, uh, say, atmospheres and maybe some very interesting um, new types of integration. So I'll finish by saying, um, in summary, <clears throat> we have a fairly large group here at Penn State. Um, all of us are very excited to explore these opportunities uh, at the intersection of synthesis science and properties and application space. Uh, we're doing this in nitrides and metals and oxides. Um, and we have a unique set of facilities that enable rapid turnaround research results all in our laboratory. Um, overlap that with our shared facilities here at Penn State. And I think there's some um, exciting opportunities to host uh, students through the PAC Fellowship. And um, you know, we're enthusiastic to, uh, say, to entertain any of those who are interested in these topics or something that you think um, would be interesting on your own. And with that, um, I guess I'll stop. All right, Sadie, are we good? Yeah, if nobody has any questions, I can we can stop the recording. Doesn't look like it. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you.